Acts chapter 2, we're going through a, a series I've titled Kingdom Living. Kingdom Living. What does it look like to build God's kingdom? What does it look like to be in heaven's atmosphere? What does it look like to live in heaven? What does it look like to live the way God intended it to be? And what does it look like uh, for the church to be built? What did it look like 2,000 years ago when the disciples were sent out by Jesus to minister the gospel, to love people, to minister the message of Jesus to those in that town in Jerusalem? That's what this Kingdom Living series is all about. We're going through the book of Acts as the church started back then. We are starting a church now. And so we get to see some great parallels of what it's supposed to look like, what it's supposed to feel like. And I think we're on track. I think we're going the right direction. I love the scripture that Jared shared this morning uh, in, there in Isaiah 43 that spoke about water, something new happening, and water coming forth out of the desert. And I like to think of that, that the Lord doing that with this church, with legacy, that in the desert, where I've heard many people say, like, it's just, you know, we didn't know where to go. We've been trying to find place and we've been trying to get plugged in. All of a sudden they come here like, we think this is the place and this seems like refreshing water to us. And right here, God doing a new work. And so I'm stoked that I get to be a part of that work and see the work that the Lord is going to do. But I'd like to tell you a little story, a little joke to open up. Yeah, a preacher was at a conference, he was asked to preach for 20 minutes. The other preachers asked to be at the conference were sitting behind him, they were speakers as well, but they weren't speaking then, they were sitting behind him in the choir section, giving him moral support and throwing in occasional amen every once in a while to keep his spirits up, you know, he was struggling. The preacher preached his 20 minutes and then continued despite the allotted time. He then preached for 30, then 40, then for an hour he was still going. He continued for an hour and 30 minutes talking away. Finally, someone sitting in the front row took one of the little hymnal song books and threw it at him. The preacher saw the song book as it was hurled his way and he ducked, matrix style, right? He ducked out of the way. And the song book hit one of the preachers sitting in the choir section behind him. As the man in the choir section was going down, you could hear him say, hit me again, I can still hear him preaching. That's the joke, that's it. You don't get any more, sorry. We're gonna talk about a message I've titled, Holy Spirit Filled Preaching. Now when you hear this title, I think some of you think, uh, you think denominationally. You think uh, in a Pentecostal church way, a way of preaching, but this is not the sermon. This is not Holy Spirit filled preaching. It's not uh, me dabbing my forehead, you know, and, and, and just, being extremely animated to try to catch your attention and go after it. That's not necessarily Holy Spirit-filled preaching. And I'm not putting down that style of preaching either. I'm just telling you, true Holy Spirit-filled preaching is what we will see before us in the text today. You will watch Peter give a Holy Spirit-filled, he's just been filled with the Spirit, a, a sermon, I should say the greatest sermon that has ever been preached. The inauguration of the church. The first sermon, God will take a simple man, Peter the fisherman, who just 50 days ago, remember, denied the Lord three times. Do you remember? I don't even know the man. I don't know this Jesus. 50 days later, God is using him to start the church. Talk about grace. He will stand up before thousands filled with the Holy Spirit, preach the good news of Christ, the gospel, and 3,000 people will be converted in that moment. Amazing. There's a clear difference between Holy Spirit-filled preaching of Peter that we will see today and man-centered preaching that we see in our culture today. And I hope to distinguish and show you the difference between the two. One is very Jesus-centered, very God-centered, and what we see a lot of times today is a very man-centered style of preaching that is not helping the church. God can use anyone, but he will only use those who are broken and ready to give up all of their life to him. Those who are willing to surrender their life to Jesus, God will use. Watch this. Isn't it amazing that God took a blue-collared guy, think about it, a smelly fisherman, 
who goes out there, throws his nets every day, and he fishes. That's what he does. How hard is it to fish after a while? Well, some of you are like, I can't even catch a fish. I get it. This man's been doing it for a while. It's probably in his family. And God takes a simple man like this and says, you're good at catching fish in the ocean or in the Sea of Galilee. I will make you a fisher of men. And Peter didn't know what God would do with him, but God did an amazing work. And it gives me hope that God can take simple people simple person like me, and use us to do extraordinary things. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Are you there? Take a look. It says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. All of a sudden there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Stop there. Okay, let's talk about this. The day of Pentecost. Would you say Pentecost with me please? Pentecost. What is this? We, we associate Pentecost with Pentecostal. But Pentecost was an actual day. Penta means 50. This was 50 days after Passover or the Feast of Weeks, which the crucifixion perfectly landed on. Pentecost is 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. 50 days after Passover, the Jews were celebrating this Feast of First Fruits. That's what Pentecost landed on. This new harvest. And this was actually, very interesting to note, the time when two th or thousands of years ago, Moses brought the Ten Commandments down from Mount Sinai. The same exact day that the, the Ten Commandments, that the law came down from Mount Sinai, just so happens to be the same day that the Holy Spirit shows up on the earth thousands of years later. Watch how God divinely plans it. It's beautiful, it's perfect, it's amazing. So it is Pentecost, and Jesus told the disciples to remember Go and wait for the Holy Spirit. Remember we talked about raising the sails in prayer and letting, the, letting your prayers be filled with God's Spirit as we raise our sails to Him constantly. They're waiting for the Holy Spirit to come and empower them to preach the gospel. And you know they had been without Jesus for 10 days now. Think this through with me. You're with Jesus for three years. He's the Messiah. He's the King. He's the Master. You, you have Jesus presence with you at all times and now you don't have him at all what does that feel like you had the one the savior the messiah with you at all times he's probably always encouraging always building up always pushing forward always doing this and now there's a moment of 10 days where they don't have anything and they don't even have the holy spirit necessarily filling them yet but now they're waiting for the holy spirit to come and help them Verses 2 and 3 tell us that the Holy Spirit came like a strong rushing wind through the house, blowing through. Can you imagine? The windows are open now here in this gym. If a strong rushing wind came through here, we would all feel it and sense it. But why a rushing wind was that the picture of the Holy Spirit? Well, I am not totally sure, but I would speculate for two reasons. Number one, to show that something was happening, something supernatural. Something out of the norm. Let's just say, what if we had the windows closed, yet a wind started to create in here? That'd be pretty crazy, right? This is supernatural. This is insane. And so we would think that something different was happening. And it is also interesting to note, second, that the word wind in the Old Testament is the word ruah. And the word wind, ruah, is actually used for the word spirit as well. Ruah is the root word for wind and spirit. They are linked together. Interestingly enough, when the Holy Spirit shows up, a mighty rushing wind comes through. Verse 3 tells us that fire came in. A fiery presence showed up. And these tongues of fire rested on each person's head. Talk about gnarly, right? Can you imagine? If, fire, if a fiery presence showed up in here and, and tongues of fire rested on each one of your heads, it, I, I mean, we would freak out, you know, we'd probably go running. But we know in the Old Testament that when God showed up, many times it was with fire. 
The burning bush, do you remember with Moses? Remember Mount Sinai on fire? Do you remember the pillar of fire that they followed after through the desert? God showed up in fire, and so it's not crazy to think that he would show up in fire when the Holy Spirit shows up. Notice that the tongues of fire, God's presence, was resting upon each believer. It is a sign that when we come to know Christ, when we come to know Christ, every single believer is filled with God's presence and spirit. In the Old Testament, when people were filled with the presence of God, something supernatural would happen. The Spirit of God came upon them. Think about Samson, you remember? And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he killed a thousand men, crazy, with a jawbone of a donkey. Or he took the gates uh, of a city and took it up to the top of a hill and threw them down. This crazy, incredible strength. I think we're like spoiled brats in the church sometimes, you know. In the days of old, when the Holy Spirit showed up, awesome stuff happened. But hey, we have the Spirit of God all the time living in us, and hey, it's no big deal, you know, we get it all the time, and you know, it's, it's kind of like good food, you know, it's like you eat it every single day all the time, and you start to say, man, I want something else. Church, I hope that you would not get tired of the Holy Spirit, and I hope you would be seeking him daily to be filled and be used. Do you realize who is backing you? Almighty God, creator of the universe, is backing you. I like to use this illustration. It's like a power plant fueling a flashlight. You've got all this power behind you to use you to do great things. All you gotta do is turn the thing on, it's just like, you know, have you seen those new flashlights? They're like this big, but they like brighten up the entire gym. You know, it's it's like a little, really little baby button. You know, you just press it, it's like, you know. We have Almighty God behind us, yet we don't do things like Peter does right here in the text. I think we're scared. I think we don't have enough faith to believe that God is actually backing us. If I step out and do something like that, people are going to think I'm crazy. Door knocking? Are you nuts, Pastor? Yes. What might happen if we go door knocking and just, we don't have to be awkward, we don't have to be weird, we can just say, hey, we just want to invite you to church, we're in the area. Oh, okay, thanks. I hate church, I'm an atheist. Oh, cool, that's cool. That's great, let's talk about it, you know? And we build relationships and before you know it, that atheist is coming to church and that atheist comes to know Christ. Maybe he's the owner of some company and he tells all of his employees, we will now have Bible study during our lunch meetings. (laughs) And he leads them. And all of a sudden, 20 or 30 people start coming to the church because of his witness. I don't know. But it doesn't happen until we step out. It doesn't happen until we we understand that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist spoke about it in this way, being baptized with fire. And that's exactly what is happening here. Verse 4 tells us that the Spirit of God, watch this, People are like, tongues are weird. You speak in tongues, man, tongues are weird. Watch this. The Spirit of God filled them to speak in tongues. Not 1 Corinthians 14 spiritual prayer tongues, no. That's another sermon. This is tongues to be able to speak in another language so that people would hear in their own dialect. It is a miracle before their eyes. Look at verse 5. I'm going to read to verse 13. Now there are dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them in their own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? And there is the list of all the languages. I won't go through them. You can look at them later. Verse 12, and all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said they were filled with new wine, or they are drunk. Interesting. This is an amazing miracle. Again, the people of Jerusalem, those who are in town, there are thousands in town from every area, every area, every part of the world in that day. Jews coming together, speaking lots of different languages. They're in town to celebrate the Feast of First Fruits. It's a great celebration. And scholars tell us that this is probably around April, May, or June. 
And so this is a very nice time to travel. And so there are definitely thousands of people in town. And Peter stands up. The apostles are filled with the Holy Spirit. And they start speaking in tongues. What does it sound like, Josh? I don't know. I don't know what, what I mean by that is I don't know what the apostles themselves were hearing. Were, were they hearing uh, nonsense coming out of their mouth? Or were they hearing perfect dialect? What I mean is, was there an exchange between two people? Like all of a sudden, uh, Peter speaks perfect Italian, you know, and he just starts going off, speaking perfect Italian, and, uh, and, and this person is hearing that way? Or did it sound like gibberish, and because of God's Holy Spirit at work, they were hearing in their own language? I'm not sure. But this is the miracle. Watch this. Simple men and women are now speaking in perfect uh, the perfect native language of each person there in the crowd. Perfect dialect. Can you imagine? Have you ever dreamed about that? Like you wish you could speak perfect French, or you wish you could speak perfect, I don't know, fill in the blank. And, and there in the dream, all of a sudden, you're like speaking very, very clear and crisp, and it's absolutely amazing. I'm telling you, it was a miracle on that day, and this is why. The people in the crowd stepped back and were saying, What? Galileans are speaking in our perfect language? Watch this, why Galileans? They were like backwoods hicks. That's the Galilean. The backwoods hick who, who, who can barely speak his own language, let alone perfect dialect in another language. That would be the miracle for me. I can barely speak English well, and now all of a sudden I can speak perfect Spanish. You know what I'm talking about? It's like I'm, I'm talking and it's coming out. I'm like, wow, wow. And it just keeps, this is good. I should take notes on myself right now. This is clear. That would be a miracle for me, but it was blowing the crowd away. But notice, the text says that some mocked and said, they're drunk. They're drunk. Look at those idiots babbling up there. Church, this is a great picture of how it will always be. An unbelievable miracle is happening right before the people's eyes, and you have two crowds. One crowd that says, amazing, and the other crowd that says, they're drunk. They make fun of it. They make fun of it. Have you ever been there? It's amazing you see a miracle happen before your eyes and the rest of the world is making fun of it. Don't be discouraged. If they made fun of Jesus, the miracle maker, the God man, the Messiah, they will definitely make fun of you. That's okay. You know what you do? You kill it with kindness. Just love on them and just be nice and watch how it changes things. Jesus said in John 15, 20, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. I'll never forget when we were, uh, I got to live in Israel for a little while and we traveled uh, the whole country twice and then we went to uh, Jordan and we stayed there uh, for a while. We actually got to stay in the Wadi Rum Desert. It was amazing. And uh, then we went down to Egypt and we stayed uh, in the west side there for a little while in Dahab and then we went down uh, to the east side and we went to Cairo and saw the pyramids and all that stuff. But we had a guy who was traveling with us, his name was Toby. And he was from England. He had the beautiful British accent, right? We sat down with him in Egypt. I'll never forget this. Uh, we were sitting down with him, and it's cool. And Dahab, like, you could, like, for five bucks, you could get the most amazing meals. I mean, just extravagant spreads and all this. And it was just like, we were kings, you know? We were just spending whatever, and we were just going after it. It was super cheap. I remember sitting down over over dinner with Toby, and we had been talking with him about Christ as he was traveling with us for like two or three weeks. I can't remember how long, maybe it, was, maybe it was just 10 days or so, but he was traveling with us for a little while, and we were a group of Christian brothers traveling together, and he was now hanging out with us, and so we started to share Christ with him. And, and, and we kept sharing more and more things, and we'd answer all his questions, and all day, every day, he was staying with us, so we'd just talk about Jesus with him and the gospel. Well, there in Egypt, we're sitting there in Dahab around the table, and I'll never forget when him saying something like this. We had spoke so much to him about Jesus that he said, listen, guys, we, we were telling him he needs to follow Jesus, he needs to become a Christian, he needs to believe the gospel, and he says, look, there's no doubt in my mind that Jesus lived, that he died and rose again from the dead because of what you guys are telling me. I get it, I understand it. And there's no doubt that these things are true. I can see it. We've had conversation about it. He was convinced. But you know what he said at the end of it? 
He says, I am convinced, and I know it's the truth, but I'm not ready to follow Jesus. And I sat back and I'm like, wow, really? He says, I'm just not ready to do this. And what I loved about it is he understood what it meant to be a follower of Christ. And he was able to make a real decision in that moment. And I would rather, Jesus said, you be hot or cold, not in between. And I believe in that moment he was cold, but I think later on one day when he knows what it means to follow Christ, he'll never forget that. I don't know, maybe we'll see him in heaven. We haven't seen him since then. But I'll never forget that day because it was clear and he could see it and he could hear it. Church, listen, legacy. I hope the world can see the fruit of Christ in your life enough to know what they are rejecting when they are rejecting it. One of the worst things you can hear someone say to you is, you're a Christian, with a question mark, kind of shocked and surprised that you are because the way that you live doesn't line up to what you say. That's got to be the worst thing ever. I would rather people mock the church because we truly live for Jesus than keep quiet because they don't know we do. Again, I would rather people mock us because they see us fully living for Christ than to sit back and say nothing because they don't even know we follow Christ. Peter stands up and preaches a Holy Spirit-filled message It's verses 14 to 41. I'm not going to read them all. I'm just going to read a couple of them. But I want to show you three things that a Holy Spirit-filled preaching looks like. And this is what I want you to receive from this church. Listen. I hope in your life it will resonate on an individual level. As you see Peter preaching to the crowd, you would see it on an individual level in your own life. I describe Holy Spirit-filled preaching in three ways. If you're taking notes, number one, God's word instead of man's word. Number two, the full gospel and not watered down gospel. And number three, a call to repentance versus no call at all. This is a Holy Spirit filled message preaching. Let's look at point number one and then I'd like to show you the scripture. Point number one, the Holy Spirit filled preaching looks like this, God's word instead of man's words. Peter preaches God's words and he uses scripture to make his point. It's verses, uh, take a look at verse 14 and 15. It says, but Peter standing with the 11 lifted up his voice and addressed them saying this, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, give ear to my words for these people are not drunk as you suppose since it is only the third hour of the day but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel and then Peter quotes the Bible. He quotes Joel chapter two, verse 28 to 32. To make his point to the crowd, he quotes scripture and then he says this. He quotes Joel and then he says, look, it's only 9 a.m., it's the third hour. Nobody's drunk, it's too early in the morning, okay? He reasons with them. But notice he quotes scripture to make his point. He also quotes Psalm 16 and Psalm 110. Church, scripture resonates with people. This is what changes lives. Nothing else will change a person's life. It's inter- isn't it interesting how this stuff can convict and change a person? Yet, I can't remember who, we were watching a TV show, I think it was Oprah trying to change Lindsay Lohan or something like that, and the whole thing fell apart completely. It's hilarious. Because people cannot change people. Only God can change people. Only scripture can change people. Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing into the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word resonates with his creation. Isn't it amazing? Again, week after week, you know, as we come in, man, that was a word for me, man, that spoke to me, man, that ministered to me, really? That's God's word, that's what it does. Have you ever opened the Bible and started reading something and you just feel it like, like why was this passage perfect for me today and it's just blowing my mind right now as I'm reading it? You wanna know why? Because it's alive. It is actually alive and it ministers and it pierces our hearts. 
The first way to identify a good sermon and a good preacher, a Holy Spirit-filled preacher, is to look and see if they even opened their Bibles. Church, listen. The first way to identify a solid church, if you end up moving away, or if you have to go and live somewhere else for some reason, or for some reason you're not able to be at Legacy and you're at another church, please look for a church that opens the Bible and teaches from it. Because the second I stop opening this and I just start getting up and giving some cool talks on fun topics, before you know it, I'm not using scripture, I'm just some good ideas for you guys today. Before you know it, we're off on tangents and we're talking about all kinds of crazy stuff. It is anchored in nothing. Some preachers are scared to share scripture at church because they don't want to offend anyone. Are you serious? Do you want anybody to be saved? (laughs) You think that your words can save people. This is the only thing that changes lives. I can't bank on a good talk for you. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna whip up a good talk today. Get you guys motivated, no? I'm just gonna tell you what this says and let the chips fall where they may and if people are offended by God's word, I'm okay with that. I'll never forget, it's, it's funny in our culture, right? People walk out, you offended me. Yeah, I shouldn't have to tolerate that. Huh? I remember I was on a college campus and we were playing some music because we had rented the facility and this song says Jesus is alive and then basically lifts, lists like a thousand people, like religious leaders and, and uh, political leaders and all these people who are dead. But Jesus is alive and all these people are dead. But Jesus is alive and all these people are dead, right? And we're sitting there playing the song before we're about to do this big outreach. When this kid walks up to me, he's like, I'm offended by that. You need to turn that music off. You can't play that out here. And, you know, I can't even believe you're doing this. You're offending me, you know, saying Jesus is alive and all these other religious leaders are dead. And I did. I said, you're offending me. How could you do that and discriminate against me? This is my song. I love this song. And this is good. And you're offending me. This is our spot right now. And he's like, oh. And he walked away. We don't need to be scared to offend people. Well, please don't offend people because you're being an idiot. Please don't do that. But listen, I'm just a delivery boy telling you what God's word says. That's what's going to change you. And so I wrote this down. No Bible equals no bueno. No Bible equals no bueno, no good. I don't want to hear what man has to say. I want to hear what God has to say. Man can change no one. God can change anyone. And I'm going to preach the Bible and the gospel. It's very simple. Kingdom living is preaching the Bible. This is kingdom preaching. Legacy. Soak your mind and your heart in God's word each day. Talk radio is not going to lift you. Uh, 102.7 is not going to lift you. (laughs) Ryan Seacrest in the fun show. That's good. That's fine. But this is what will get inside of your hearts and change you. Many of you are starving because you haven't had your daily bread. You need to get in God's word and allow it to fill you. Number two, Holy Spirit filled preaching always shares the full gospel and not a watered down gospel. I call it the good news and the bad news. Peter is very direct with his preaching. He uses strong language here in the text and preaches the full gospel. Let me read the scriptures to you. It is found verse 22 to 24, listen, he says, watch how direct Peter is. If Peter is this direct, Preachers should be this direct, and we should be this direct at certain moments. Watch this. Verse 22, he says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God, and with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And then he goes on. Look down at verse 32. This Jesus God raised up of that we are all witnesses. Take a look at verse 36. 
Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Verse 38, and Peter said to them, repent, repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter preaches the whole gospel. And I'll just talk about this for just a second. The good news is not good news without the bad news. Did you know that? Watch this. Actually, the bad news, when you hear the bad news first, it actually makes the good news better. Do you know what the full message of the gospel is? We need to share that people are sinners. Don't call me a sinner. Sinner, sinner, sinner. I'm not a sinner. Yeah, you are. You've been doing wrong since the day you were born. Your mom had to try to teach you to do right. All you do is wrong. Me too. And I need God to save me from that sin. And you can't save yourself. You can't pay money for it. You can't do anything to get out of that sin. You need Christ to forgive you of that sin. That's some bad news, and people don't like to hear that, but it's the truth. But you see, when you see the bad news, it amplifies the good news that Jesus came to pay for that sin and take care of it for you and you don't have to do anything to receive that forgiveness. You basically, simply believe on Christ so much in this message that you turn your direction of belief and start believing in that message and following after Christ all the days of your life. Realize you're a sinner. Recognize the work that Jesus did on the cross and in his resurrection. He was punished for your sin. He rose again on the third day to show it to be true, promising that he will raise you from the dead and redeem your life. Repent. People don't like that word, huh? Repent. Why don't they like that word? Because it sounds like an old Baptist preacher like ready to stone people or something, you know? Condemning everyone to hell. I get it. You know what repent means? It just means to turn direction. Turn away from walking that way, not believing in your God, not walking with Jesus, and just turn and walk with your God. And so guess what we are going to do? We're going to tell people they need to repent and turn to Christ. It's the only way they're going to change is by turning to God. They need to receive the forgiveness and salvation of the new life in Jesus. Pastors are scared to lose people in their church so they won't preach the full gospel. But if I call people sinners and talk about the negative stuff, they're not going to come back next week. Au contraire, my friend. I believe the opposite is true. That when we preach the truth, people are actually changed and you will actually grow the church. Listen to this scripture. Have you heard this before? 2 Timothy 4.3. A time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. Watch this. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. Right? Isn't that our culture? God forbid that I start preaching only things that I know that you want to hear. What will that do for a people? It helps no one. We are here to preach the truth of God's word and let people be changed by it. Many churches are preaching come to Jesus, but come to Jesus from what? What are you turning away from? Many preach come to Jesus for a better life with no problems. That's a lie, don't listen to that. Jesus calls people to give up their life and follow him to turn away from the sinful lifestyle, set aside your desires, your wants, to follow and submit yourself to his wants, his desires for your life. Yes, I would argue it is the best way to live because that's the way God made it, but it is not easy, it is sacrifice. It's hard, it's difficult at times. We are suppressing the desires inside of us. We are not following after what my body wants to do, what my mind wants to do. I was born this way, sure, I know you were. You were born a sinner to sin and you don't get to live that out. God is commanding you not to live that out and to come close to him. Listen to this. The world doesn't know what it means to be a Christian because preachers are too scared to proclaim it. Too many preachers are preaching a watered down gospel thus creating a watered down church. 
You see, I believe that with solid preaching over time, it will change us and we will actually be a church of real Christians who love and serve people. Isn't that the worst thing? What if, watch this, what if we just had this place packed out? There's like, let's just say we're cramming everybody in. There's like 800 people just pushed up against the walls and everybody's here and it's just a big fun time, right? And I'm just like, yeah, and party and more fun and this and that. And everybody's like, yeah, we're all Christians, yeah. And Pastor Jaws the best. And then you guys all go away, not convicted by anything, and you live like hell. And you muddy the message of the gospel. No one sees your Christianity. You're just a person who comes to church on Sunday and doesn't live for Christ during the week at all. What does that do for the kingdom? Instead, I hope I would be convicted, you would be convicted, and it would change us. True gospel preaching brings true gospel repentance. Peter preaches the clear truth of the gospel to this crowd, and this is why he has clear conversions, 3,000 to be exact. My final point for Holy Spirit-filled preaching is Holy Spirit-filled preaching calls people to repentance versus no call at all. Look at verse 37 in your Bibles. It says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received this word were baptized and there were added to that that day about 3,000 souls. Amazing. Notice, after Peter preached the full gospel to them, they were convicted And watch this, church. They naturally ask the question, what should we do? And Peter told them, repent and turn to God. Because Peter, being led by the Holy Spirit, commanded the crowd to repent, after they asked what to do, guess what they did? They repented. And it blows my mind to think that a a preacher would preach a sermon, and at the end of the message, people are convicted And sure enough, are saying in their hearts, what should we do? What should we do, pastor? And the pastor does nothing. They just close in prayer. They close the service. And I'm thinking, why don't you tell the people to repent and turn away from their sins and turn to God? Why would you do it? Why would you preach an amazing message like that and then absolutely do nothing and let them walk away? I'm thinking, why don't you tell the people to repent and turn away from sin and turn to Jesus? Church, many pastors don't do this for many reasons. Some are scared they will create a false convert. Others are scared that no one will respond. Because Peter gave a call, 3,000 clearly repented that day, and if Peter gives a call to repentance in the greatest sermon ever preached, I will do the same. What does a true call to repentance look like? I define it in three ways. A moment of confession to God. Call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Luke 18, do you remember the guy beating his chest? The tax collector looks to heaven and says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus says, God hears that prayer. It is a moment, second, it is a moment of belief in the message of the gospel where you truly believe this message, completely believe it. Romans 10, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Then it is a decision to believe so much so that you start following the teachings of Jesus for the rest of your life. It's amazing to see the way God used a simple man, Peter. I'm telling you, church, we will always call people to repentance in some form, And I want to encourage you as believers to don't be scared to call people to repentance as well in your own life. But wait for the opportunity. I get to do this because the word of God goes out each week. But you don't go to Thanksgiving and just yell repent to everybody. Okay, it's not going to work. 
But you love your family, you serve your family, you love your friends, you serve your friends, and when the opportunity comes, you can ask them to turn to Christ and turn away from their lifestyle. Did you know that? Why are Christians so scared to do this? It's amazing to me that preachers are scared to do this and they have no results, or very few results. But it's amazing to me that Peter chose to do this and there were results. God will use us if we allow him. And so I'm asking you, church, today to first on take on these attributes and characteristics in your own life. Be a person of the word. Be a person of the gospel who shares it with people. Be a person who actually will call people to come to church or to come to repentance and to serve God. The Lord will use this church if we so choose to do it. But if we just sit back, we just show up each week and, I mean, I, I, I'm really am blown away. Somebody was telling me earlier that they were praying for me. It, you know, we've been talking about taking a break and praying. And I thank you guys for that because the Lord is definitely doing a work in this place. And I know that you feel that and you sense that. It's like, man, look at this new work. God's gonna do something. Church, listen, the only way God is going to do something is all of us respond to these ideas. We really start living out these ideas as Peter did. Watch this. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and then he proclaimed the good news. Are we filled with the Holy Spirit today? I believe many of you are. I believe most of you are. You have the Spirit of God living in you. Then don't waste this week and minister that message to somebody. Step out and allow God to use you this week. Proclaim the good news. Proclaim this message. 